the existence of time, right? There's this story that's in, in physics of Boltzmann who had this kind of idea of it basically being more ways, you know, this is the second law that we kind of touched on earlier, um, more ways for things to be disordered than ordered. So that kind of results in time flowing in one direction rather than the other direction. But then in your view, I think, well, all experiences unfold over time. You can't have an experience in an instant. So in this world view, the mechanism of time must be there at the beginning in consciousness. There must be structure and time, no? Yeah. No, uh, but <laughs> I, I recognize where you're coming from. Uh, it's very intuitive uh, what you're saying. Um, a philosopher wrote about it in Scientific American, I think two years ago, which was basically saying panpsychism cannot be true um, because uh, we know that certain particles are, are timeless and they're going at the speed of light. Uh, so there cannot be anything it is like to be them. So panpsychism is false. I forgot her name. It was a philosopher, not a physicist. Um, but before, before I try to drag you, you down the rabbit hole, uh, let me just give you some historical context so it doesn't look like I am, like I am absolutely crazy. <laughs> so there, I have some precedents who said, uh, who said that. You know, since Kant, um, the West um, has been dealing with this idea that maybe time and space are categories of perception. They are the scaffolding of your perceptual processes. They are not objective. They are not out there. Schopenhauer echoed that and said the same thing. Uh, um, space and time are the, the, the scaffolding of representation. They are not the thing in itself. They're not the will. The will is timeless. The will is one and timeless. It was his way of saying universal consciousness is one and timeless and spaceless. Uh, I, I agree with that. Um, uh, in physics, there are people who say that time don't exist. Julian Barbour wrote a book in 1999 about it. Um, the End of Time is the wonderful name of this book. Um, there are other physicists who say time is all there is. Um, uh, what's his name? A friend of Julian Barbour, uh, Lee Smolin. Um, he thinks that uh, space is an illusion, but time is the only dimension that exists. And you have the whole new gang of quantum loop, loop gravity theorists who say that, well, time exists, but it's epiphenomenal. It, it arises out of quantum processes. It's not a pre-existing scaffolding to physics. Time itself arises, which, which is now, a, it's almost a mainstream view in science. Um, you know, the idea that time itself began in the Big Bang, that it wasn't a pre-existing scaffolding within which the Big Bang happened. Um, but your, your point is, is more experiential. You're saying experience can only unfold in time. There is no immediate experience without a dimension of time. Uh, I, 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 I will not dismiss this. I will not poo-poo your point of view uh, because it's very intuitive. I think 99 of 100, out of 100 people would directly agree with you. But I would invite you to think a little more carefully, a little more deeply about it. And you will realize that there is no dimension of time in experience. Time itself, the concept of time is an immediate experience. Um, what leads us to talk about time is our memories and our expectations. The memories we link to the past, our expectations we link to the future. But memories only exist in so far as they are experienced now, as memories. If you experienced a memory a second ago, well, that experience is itself a memory that, that you are experiencing now, one second later. Your expectations only exist in so far as you are, ex are experiencing them now. Uh, you cannot point to the past and say, there is the past. You cannot point at your prior experience and say, experiences and say, there, there they are, my prior experiences. No. Uh, they only exist in so far as you recall them now. Same for the future. You cannot point there and say, there is the future. Um, I, I wrote, uh, a, well, um, extensively about it in, in, in a book called um, More Than Allegory in part two. Part two of that book, about one third of the book, I talk about uh, this idea of time, where it's coming from, what it actually is, what can we say from an experiential perspective. I even got an essay published on Scientific American uh, arguing what I'm arguing to you right now and against that philosopher who said the opposite, saying that actually there is no time in experience. Our very concept of time is an immediate experience. Now, this opens up a whole rabbit hole of implications and consequences and, and, and associations in your thinking 
um, and it, it can lead you to the conviction, for instance, that um, you may be traveling in time all the time because <laughs> it's not really there. Yeah. Time is, is a landscape of the present. That landscape that's, that is uh, stretched out uh, in your mind in the form of memories and expectations. We do this in the now. It's like a, a big bang that happens in the now. We stretch out the inten intangibility uh, of the present moment, which is it, it's so small, it's intangible. It, mind stretches it out into the solidity of a historical timeline. But that stretching out is itself instantaneous. We are not going to get uh, to get uh, to, a, to a comfortable place with this uh, in one interview, but I would invite you have a look at my uh, essay on Scientific American. You can type my name, Bernardo Castro on Scientific American. There are several essays. One of them is about time. And the, the, the title is, do we experience the flow of time? Uh, I like the title. My yeah, so I actually, yeah, I actually agree with everything you said. And I guess I should maybe in, instead of conjuring up the image of a linear time that kind of exists, you know, on some kind of, that the past genuinely exists and the future genuinely exists. I guess what I mean is that in the present moment, there's this, um, there's a directionality. There's, I think I, this is tied up with um, the fact that I guess I don't personally see consciousness as a substance that exists kind of in its own right. I see it as this kind of strange flux, this strange kind of relative process. And it's in the change that it exists. It's only a process. You know, I guess if you were to force me to have an ontology, it would be a process ontology of, of saying it's not hard oh, matter. Head. It's not, not just mind. It's, it's, it's all flux, you know, you could start with nothing and then out of polarity and just relative change, there's something seems to be happening and the thing in itself is mysterious, but there's this flux. And so I see this as being linked to the concept of, um, of emptiness in Buddhism. The, if you really, we think, we think that red is a kind of, is a thing that we really, you know, it's like a kind of qualia, like an atom of, um, of experience, but if you really pay attention, there's not really anything there. It's not made of anything. I and so I think that's the thing that makes me, makes me kind of, the idea of consciousness as a substance, I guess, is it would be my main objection. I don't think consciousness is a substance, literally, because what is a substance? A substance is something that mind points to and says uh, that exists. But uh, mind is not that. Mind is, is here. It's that which does the pointing. It's not what is pointed to but the, the thing doing the pointing. I think the nature of consciousness itself, I think experiences are excitations of consciousness. You can think of it like a guitar string playing a note. Um, and that's why there is variety of experience in only one consciousness. There are different patterns of excitation of consciousness. One is red, the other one is a bellyache, another one is falling in love. Um, these are patterns of excitation of this medium which I don't think is a substance. I don't think it's an object. I don't think it's a medium, but language forces me to attribute a noun to it. I, I, I have to give it a noun, a name, otherwise I cannot talk about it. And, but I, I think what it is in and of itself, when it's not excited, if this thing is at all possible, maybe consciousness is always undergoing some pattern of excitation, but what it is in and of itself is impossible to know because it, it is the one asking the question. It is consciousness that is asking the question, what is consciousness exactly in and of itself? If you want the, the answer to that question, study the question. Do you understand what I mean? It, 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 the yeah, answer yeah. is in the question. It, it, it's not going to come. You're not going to derive an answer through steps of logical reasoning. The answer is built into the question because the answer is the thing asking the question or the X asking the question. Um, uh, what you said echoes uh, Whitehead process philosophy. Um, it's another way of approaching it. Uh, 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 he, he avoids talking about nouns at all costs. I think the price he pays for that is ambiguity and incoherence. So I, <laughs> I don't go down that road. Moreover, it's impossible to talk about it in the culture at large. That's why white headians are such a small community. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm not going to do that. It's, it's a losing proposition. Uh, I understand the motivation for that. It, you, you articulated it very well, what the motivation for that is. I just, I, I make a concession uh, for the benefit of reaching people, if you know what I mean. Um, 
but this is not the question you asked. Um, oh yeah. Uh, I think it is. That was a wonderful answer. <laughs> you, 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 you insisted on the part about uh, entropy. There is an arrow of time uh, because the laws of physics seem to. Oh, be, we can go back to that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they seem to be time yeah, symmetrical. So actually, just to clarify that, yeah, I I would say that I don't see time as fundamental in any sense, but I feel like the corner of the universe where we exist as physical processes is dependent on entropy, and that's why experience unfolds when I say over time, we have to understand that I'm talking about a present moment that's changing, say change rather than time. Um, and if there was no change, if you freeze, take a freeze frame of the universe, I, I think there wouldn't be experience. Um, but yeah, you can take it from there. Okay. Um, I think we are in a freeze frame of the universe <laughs> all the time. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but okay. Um, um, I think time is a is the scaffolding of perception. It's not out there. Time is in us. We are not in time. I think that's the, the reality of the situation. Time is in us. We are not in time. Um, we are born. Uh, birth and death happen within us, not to us, if you know what I mean. Um, now, having said that, obviously, there is this illusion we call time. To deny that there is something we call time would be just precious, right, and silly. Um, uh, even if it's not ultimately real, there is a, there is a process happening that we call time, and we, everybody agrees that that process seems to be happening. Um, I'm not going to invalidate or dismiss that. I think it's illusory, but the illusion is happening. The illusion has a structure. That structure can be modeled. That's why we have T in many equations in physics. Actually, you can write the whole of physics without T, but uh, as Julian Barbour has shown. Uh, but if you write it with T, it works as well. And, and it's easier to understand. So there is something out there that illusory as it may be, there is a structure to it that is amenable to modeling and prediction. And that is important. Because you see, I'm an idealist. I think always in mind. By saying that, I am granting ontological reality to illusions. Uh, it's materialism that says that illusions are nothing, uh, because all that exists is outside mind, and illusion is only mind. Therefore, it, it, you can dismiss it. You can ignore it. No, I think that all that's happening is mental. It's all a kind of dream. And the question is, uh, what part of that dream is uh, consensus? is shared, and what part is idiosyncratic, is you making up stuff in your head. Uh, but in essence, the ontological essence of reality and illusion is the same. The only difference is to what degree there is consensus, to what degree it is believed, to what degree is it shared in a culture, in a society, in a group. Um, so I think the illusion of time is very relevant. Uh, its structure and its predictability are very relevant. But I don't think analytic idealism will solve the mysteries of time uh, because it's not science. Um, uh, you know, uh, with the, the same mouth that I will uh, criticize scientists pretending to be, philo or thinking that, that science is philosophy and, and talking nonsense, with that same breath, I would say that philosophers who think they can replace science are full of it. Um, and uh, so I, th there are different methods that are better applicable to different problems. Um, I, I will go as far as to say time is an illusion, but illusions under idealism are rele relevant. Um, but it's not up to me to solve uh, that, that illusion. I think analytic idealism inherits that, that problem just as materialism does, just as dualism does. There is a mystery to time. There is a mystery to entropy. The laws of physics are symmetrical, but the world seems to go in only one direction. Why is that happening? What is it exactly? What is this business that time stops on the event horizon of a black hole? What is this business that for, for a photon, time, time never passes because it's always going at the speed of light? I mean, these are equations that have enormous predictive power. They are pointing at something true. Uh, I'd like to know that, but I don't think analytic idealism answers it. 